So we all know that at the root of many of the diseases that we are facing today, whether they are cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, immunologic diseases, autoimmune diseases, stress is a major factor. And people think that stress only comes in the mental form or the psychological form, which means you worry, you take tension, you're a born worrier, you're anxious, you're panicking, and you get stress. The reality is there are many different forms of stress that we as human beings are exposed to. There are physical stressors, chemical stressors, mental and emotional stressors, psychological stressors, and then spiritual stressors. And what we're going to focus on today, at least in my section of the presentation, is how the physical and chemical stressors influence our health. Because food, air, and water are ultimately the main forms of interface, of energy exchange between us and our environment. So we know what water pollution has done to us. And what I'll share with you is a little bit of an idea about what air pollution, both indoor and outdoor, is doing to our health. Now, as was mentioned in the earlier presentation, recently the World Health Organization listed Delhi, our capital, as the most polluted city amongst 1,600 cities in 91 countries. Now, while it is nice to be first in certain places, this is a very dubious distinction. And one in which, within a span of three years, we've taken a major oil refinery city called Ardhavas in Iran and Beijing, China, and several other highly polluted cities. And now, Delhi, Patna, Raipur, Lucknow, cities that, some of the cities like Dehradun are in the top 20 list. So clearly this is a problem that is very much here and very much live and very much affecting us. If you look at the indoor air quality, it is estimated that about 3.5 million deaths per year are caused due to indoor air pollution. Of that, a very significant chunk in, is in India, but unfortunately, we do not have very good studies to present that data yet. Work is ongoing on those. So the impact that we are looking at with regards to what air quality does to our health. So as an allergist, immunologist, and asthma specialist, what I can tell you is one of the biggest diseases that is rising worldwide. And this started with the, what we call developed countries or westernized countries in the 60s and 70s was a rise in allergy and asthma. This rise progressively went on for a period of about 40 years and somewhere in the 2000, it started to plateau a little but continues to rise. So where US, London, UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand were capitals for allergy and asthma in the world, we started to see that trend starting in the late 90s in India. Just on a personal level, when I used to practice and was training to be a doctor at St. G.S. Medical College in Mumbai, in the entire pediatric ward, I would hardly see one or two children on a nebulizer. And within a span of five years, when I started returning to the country every single year, to both train, teach, and educate physicians as well as see patients here, I started seeing a progressive rise to the point that now in the winter season, half the pediatric ward is filled with children who are having wheezing, bronchiolitis, bronchitis, pneumonia, or some unexplainable respiratory disorder triggered by what is blamed on a virus. Now clearly along with this, the incidence of allergies in India has been rising. We would hardly see any patients of environmental or food allergies. Both of these are tremendously increasing in India now. And the estimated numbers on this is a 100 to 200 percent increase in cases that we are seeing within a span of two decades. It is estimated that in India, about 10 to 12 percent of the population has at some point of time had a respiratory problem that was labeled as asthma. So this is called a lifetime prevalence. When we look at the incidence, the current incidence, 
it runs at about 5 to 6 percent of the population. When you look in the pediatric or the children's age range, that number is higher. Now the next interesting fact is that 85 percent of children with asthma who have been confirmed to have asthma, their disease is driven by allergies, environmental allergies. And this has been proven in very large cohort studies where they've literally enrolled babies before they were born. So from the pregnant women stage and followed them for a period of 20, 25, 30, some studies are going into their 40th year. And they're finding that clearly the kids who develop allergies early in life were the ones who developed respiratory disorders like asthma, bronchitis, more than other people. And they were the ones who were going on to have the disease for a very long time in their life. So even sometimes they used to go into what we call remission in their teenage years or in their 20s and 30s. And they would then go on to have again a recurrence of their asthma or respiratory disease in their 30s, 40s and 50s. Some of this was driven by stress, different types like I mentioned. Some of it was driven by allergies. Some of it was driven by them taking up habits like smoking. But when you look at the combined factor, it becomes very, very clear that allergic disorders are tremendously affecting our population. The estimated number for India, and this is a conservative estimate, is that about 20% of the population has some form of allergy. So I'm not talking only respiratory allergy now. We are talking respiratory allergy, we are talking food allergies, we are talking drug allergies, we are talking contact allergies. So as an allergic diathesis, as a tendency to develop an allergy, the incidence is very, very high right now in India. And in this process, what we have come to realize from studies that were done in the 70s, 80s, 90s in the developed nations is that the quality of the air is very, very critical towards these disorders and the stress factor right from maternal stress during pregnancy all the way through life. So in many of the cities where we have a very high level of outdoor pollution, there's obviously a tremendous what we call oxidative damage or oxidative stress that occurs on the body. It's a chemical stressor. Along with it, you take into consideration that these particles can actually penetrate into the smallest alveoli and bronchioles in the lungs. So there's a direct physical damage that they cause. The next step is that they cause an immune damage because they really activate our immune system heavily. So the immune system which was peacefully waiting for the next bacteria, virus or parasite to interact and face it or cancer cell for that matter to face it and eliminate it from the body is now having to face all these gases, volatile organic compounds, um, particulate matters and facing those takes away from a critical immune system. So when it takes away from the critical immune system and what is designed to do, you now start seeing new diseases come up which are related to air pollution. So you start seeing autoimmune diseases, you start seeing cardiovascular diseases, you start seeing neuropsychological diseases, headache, chronic fatigue syndrome, sinusitis, rhinitis. From head to toe, there is a long list of diseases that can be connected to very poor air quality. And I've just mentioned a fraction of those right now. So when we look at the fact that the outdoor air, we recognize that there are uh, People ask me what are the reasons for these rises. The obvious answers are there. So there's a lot of construction work going on that creates a lot of particulate matter and gases. Uh, there's a lot of sewage and dumping. There's a lot of industry and chemical fumes that come. Now this is all outside and we do get some replenishment of our outdoor air because of nature's and mother nature's kind gift and grant to us that it can actually clear these things out through changes of seasons, weather, but when it comes to indoor air, we are really stuck in some ways, just as the air gets stuck in some ways. And so here we have a lot of different sources, right from the very obvious ones, and there is a direct correlation between the mother or father smoking and the child developing asthma or respiratory problems early in life, which is a very obvious given. 
So if you have a home in which there is a parent smoking, you're going to have problems. No, it's a no-brainer. But now within that, you add all the other forms of air pollution that we can get. The things that we can't see, the things that we don't suspect. So right from something as innocuous as lighting incense sticks, using an air freshener, a deodorant, a perfume, to the type of paints that are used, to the kind of construction materials that are used, varnishes that are used, to the kind of furniture materials and construction materials that are used, to the cooking that is done in the home, to the gases that it releases, the type of oils that are being used. And when you open your window, it's not necessarily always fresh air that comes in. You get a whole new segment of pollutants that can come in depending on the time of day when you open your windows. So we all know that in the morning in certain cities like Delhi, Mumbai, in certain seasons, you will see a smog layer in the morning, 5, 6, 7 a.m. till the sun rises and it kind of clears it through the heating effect that it has. And in that smog, a major portion is ozone. Now ozone at a certain level above our Earth's uh, crust is protective because it protects us from ultraviolet light. But when it is formed in our homes or in our environment that we can breathe it, it actually causes damage to our respiratory system, our immune system, and overall to our health. There are even people who will connect poor air quality with rapid aging. As was mentioned earlier, life expectancy decreases due to pollution. What is that? It's a faster aging process. So when we look at the impact within the house, so another common example that I give people when they ask me the sources for indoor air pollution, I would say in a classroom, people would never think that the chalk that is being used to write on the board and then clean, I can't tell you how many of my children that I treat will complain that when that is going on, they have more trouble with their breathing, especially if they don't have well-controlled allergies and asthma, if they're not being treated appropriately. So it can be as innocuous as that. And when you look into the, so is this a problem only limited to our metros and big cities? No. You go into the villages and you will see there's a problem with biomass fuel usage. So there was a time when chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in a rural environment, because generally clean air helps prevent that, was hugely being driven by the use of biomass fuel in closed environments, whether it is kerosene, wood burning or other forms of gober gas or biogas if there was a good ventilation. So the more we are living in homes that are modernized, fancy, the more we are living in what I look at now more and more as a sealed box, the more we are getting exposed to things that are not getting clear from our environment. And these are impacting everything from our respiratory system our immune system, our cardiovascular system. I would even say that some of the gastrointestinal diseases that we face today seem to ameliorate in the patients whom I recommend some air quality changes. Because after all, it's a uniform stress that the body is facing. The body does not distinguish that I'm going to only cause problems because it's a respiratory exposure that only the respiratory system will get affected. And as I mentioned, the neurological, neuropsychological, there have been studies that have actually shown that by improving air quality, the degree of depression that a person may be under also seems to change. These are very subtle correlations. Because if you get fresh air, you feel happier. There was a time, and it is written in our Shastra, I quote this in Hindi, where it is said that hawa hi dawa hai. I'm a big believer because I believe in these two statements very, very strongly. You are what you eat and hawa hi dawa hai. We won't talk about food, it's not the topic of interest here. I have tremendous insights on that that I have gained in the last 23 years in this field. But coming back to air, there was a time when if you had a chronic disease that doctors back then didn't have the diagnostics, no CT scan, no MRI, no X-ray, no sputum collection, no bacteriology, none of those things, they would send you to a hill station or to a beachside resort for three to six months. 
and the person will get better. No medications. Eat clean, live clean, breathe clean. And now, we are faced with a situation where we can't leave where we are. We can maximum get a month's vacation, two months if we are lucky, maybe four months in a year, depending on our profession. So where we are, where we work, where we live, where we stay, where we travel, where we shop, everywhere we are exposed to certain ingredients in our air that are not in our best benefit. The question comes up, what can we do for it? When we talk of outdoor pollution, it requires major intervention at a very big level. And it is occurring in places. For example, when the entire taxi and auto rickshaw industry was moved from using diesel and petrol to CNG gas, it clearly made an impact on outdoor air pollution. But was that enough? Clearly no, because we continue to rise and now reached the top of the list as the most polluted country or, or city in the world. So when people ask me, what is it that then we can do? So we can't change the outdoors. I tell them that at least start by changing the indoors. So in the field of allergy, it is very clearly known that if someone has an allergy to house dust mite or to fungus or mold uh, or to a pet dander, you know, cat, dog, guinea pig, whatever you may have in the house. And if you have a sensitivity to that, if you remove that from the...